I love Thanksgiving. I love being able to eat good food with people that you love. And it just, just thinking about it right now, looking back, thinking, just brings joy to your heart. Um, and in a similar way, this, this psalm is very much like Thanksgiving. I'll taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. We are going to gather as a body of believers this morning and reflect on the goodness of God. Taste and see that he is good. It's infinite more joy than the joy of thanksgiving is the joy of the goodness of God. And so as we turn our attention to Psalm 34, I invite you to stand in honor of the public reading of God's word. Psalm 34, beginning in verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you as saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Let's pray. Father, may we enjoy you together this morning. May you be exalted in this place among us. May you watch over your word now and perform it in our hearts and in our lives. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. On the surface, this psalm appears to be a happy psalm, a joyful psalm, and it is. It's a very happy and joyful psalm. However, it is birthed from affliction. It comes from one who has been afflicted. David wrote Psalm 34 as a response to God rescuing him from one of the most dangerous situations in his life. The historical setting is actually stated in your Bible prior to verse 1. It says, Psalm 34, of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. Now, this story is recorded in 1 Samuel 21, but for the sake of time, I want to briefly summarize it so that we can get some context behind this psalm. So in 1 Samuel, David is basically being hunted by Saul. Saul wants David dead. He has tried multiple times to even pin David against the wall with his spear. He wants him gone. And so David is afraid for his life, and he flees to Gath. And this is significant because Gath is one of the primary cities of the Philistines. Gath is also the hometown to Goliath, whom David has just killed earlier in the story. Not only that, David is carrying with him Goliath's sword, which David used to cut Goliath's head off. And so David is not in a good place. The people of Gath recognize David, and this terrifies him. This reported to the king. He's found out. And so David, in response to his fear and his anxious heart, he acts like a madman. He literally acts like he is insane. You have the verse that some of you may recognize, and his spittle ran down his beard. He acts crazy. Now, I have a David-like beard this morning, but I'm not going to act this out for you. That would be wrong, inappropriate. But David acts crazy out of fear. And the king, instead of killing him, kicks him out of the city. And David is miraculously spared. He then flees to the cave of Adullam, and he is alone, fear for his life. But he has experienced this miraculous deliverance. Now, I want to make a few remarks before diving into this psalm. First, David's behavior here in 1 Samuel is not prescribed, rather it is described. We are not encouraged biblically to act in the way David has acted to get ourselves out of trouble. We are not to act in a misleading way to get ourselves out of a particular trouble that we face. It is merely described, but the heart here in Psalm 34 is a humble reminder that God delivers imperfect 
people because of his goodness, not ours. That's important to remember. And so this season of David's life has such an impression upon him that the Holy Spirit inspires him to write one of the most joyful psalms of the Bible. So let's look at the first section, an invitation to praise in verses 1 through 3. Which, by the way, in the notes that you may have gotten, one side, Pastor Robbie preached the same text. His notes are on one side of the notes, and then mine are on the other side, just for your information as you track with me. Verses 1 through 3, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. So the first part of this psalm is filled with worship. David uses words like bless and praise, boast, magnify, exalt. These are words used here not to describe, not to make something small seem greater, but to affirm the supremacy and the greatness of someone who is already supreme and great. There are a few questions that we can use to gain some specifics as to the worship David is expressing in these verses. And the first is who? Who is David worshiping? And that is the Lord God. He says, I will bless the Lord, capital L-O-R-D. That is, the Lord God is to be praised. The Lord God is to be blessed and boasted in, magnified and exalted, not because he needs us to do that, but because he alone is worthy of this praise. He alone is exalted. He alone is magnified. He is to be praised. When is he to be praised? He is to be praised at all times. David says in verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. In other words, there is never a moment or season in our lives when the Lord is not worthy of praise. Never a circumstance, never a situation where he is not worthy. Now, I don't know if any of you got the chance to come on Wednesday night this past Wednesday to our Thanksgiving service. I, I did, and it was such a joy. I sat in the back and listened to God's people share and boast in the Lord and bless his name. People coming from all different walks of life. People walked in the doors living on the mountaintops of life. Bless the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord. And at the same time, there were people that walked and came into this room that shared testimony that are living in the valleys of life and said, bless the Lord. He's good. He's worthy to be praised at all times. How is he to be praised? He is to be praised with everything in us. Verse 2, my soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. So David is not only praising the Lord with his lips, but his entire being is involved in the praise of the Lord. John Calvin said the term soul in this passage signifies not the vital spirit, but the seat of the affections. David is boasting in the Lord with every fiber of his being, with the depths of his heart. His boast is in the Lord. And it says that this makes the humble hear and and are glad. So why are the humble, why do they hear and, and are made glad? I think for a few reasons. First of all, the humble are the only ones that recognize that we have nothing in ourselves worth boasting in. A proud person can't boast in the Lord. A proud person doesn't delight in boasting in the Lord. The humble recognize that apart from Christ, we are nothing. And our boast is in Christ alone. But second, God's people Enjoy listening to one another boast in the Lord. It's a testimony. It is, an, it is evidence that we have been redeemed by God when we delight in hearing others share in the grace of God in their life. That's a picture of what happened even on Wednesday night as people shared and expressed praise and thanks to what God is doing in their lives. People would clap and rejoice with them. This evidence that we have been redeemed by the Lord, the humble hear and are glad. And this praise toward a God so worthy, and this praise is so consuming that it compels David to invite others in to this worship. So he is to be praised with everything in us, and he is to be praised 
with other people. Verse 3, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. We'll revisit this idea again at the end of the passage. But C.S. Lewis taught this great truth that joy is incomplete until it is expressed. If you don't know this and you have little kids, you're going to find this out in just a few weeks when they run into the living room in their pajamas and they unwrap the gift. Do they hold it in? No. They have to tell everybody and show everybody and ask you a million times to watch them play with this gift and tell their grandparents and their aunts and their uncles and their cousins and their siblings and their friends, look at this, share with me in this joy. Is what we do. True worship of God is the enjoyment of God that overflows into beckoning others to join in with us. True worship of God is the enjoyment of God that overflows into beckoning others. Join with me in this joy. And that is what David is experiencing. That is why we're here this morning. We don't just come to church because that's what we've always done. So we block out an hour on Sunday morning. We don't just come to church because that's what mom and dad taught us to do. Because it's just the thing to do in the South. You, you go to church on Sunday morning. We come as the redeemed of God, to share collectively in the joy that we have in Christ. We have to. We must do it. Charles Spurgeon said that corporate worship is one of the most natural instincts of the new life given to us in Christ. It's another evidence that we have been redeemed because we want to share in this joy with our brothers and our sisters in Christ. So David then transitioned into verses 4 through 7 where he records the testimony behind the worship in verses 1 through 3. So look with me at the testimony of David in verses 4 through 7. He says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. The first thing I want us to see here is that David experiences serious difficulties. Now, if you recall back to 1 Samuel 21, we see he's referring to troubles and fears in these verses. And we see in 1 Samuel 21 what those troubles and those fears are. I didn't mention that Saul arguably one of the most powerful, prominent people in the known world at this time. Saul, Saul's son is David's best friend, Jonathan. David has served Saul faithfully. David has honored Saul. He's respected Saul. He's given his life to, to be his servant. And, and now Saul wants him dead. Saul's mission from here on out is have David killed. David can go nowhere, no place where he doesn't have to think someone here may want my life. I don't know if anybody in this room can relate to David, but my guess is that everybody in this room can relate to fears and troubles. Everyone in this room can relate to that. Isn't it remarkable? A room this size with this many people Every one of you created in the image and likeness of God walked through those doors and you have a story. You have a story. I don't know who said it, but the quote comes to mind. You've never met a boring person. They don't exist. You might think you've met a boring person, but everyone has a story. Everyone can identify with legitimate fears. Everyone can identify with legitimate troubles. Some of you have troubles and fears so dark that no one in this room, no one in this world knows what you're dealing with in this moment. Only you, some of you don't even know how to make it day by day. You're just walking minute by minute, day by day. You don't know where deliverance comes from. If you were to go to lunch with David after this service, my guess is that he would open the Bible and he would share with you his testimony from verses 4 through 7. 
He would encourage you from these verses, from his own life. And what we see here is the advice that David would give you, the encouragement that David would share is incredibly profound in these verses. But it is also incredibly simple. And we often miss incredibly profound advice when it's covered up in simplicity. But that's, that's what the, the testimony of David is. It's very simple. In the midst of his difficulties, David, number one, sought the Lord. Verses 4 and 6, I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. So this does not mean that David looked for a God that was hard to find. This means that David asked for help from an accessible God. He didn't merely ask for help. He cried for it. He cried for it out of poverty. And praise God that God does not wait on David to get his act together. David doesn't say, you better clean yourself up, David. You're acting like a fool before I listen to you. No, God hears the cries of poor, imperfect people. And praise God that he does, or else he would not hear one of us. The Bible says that he is opposed to the proud. He does not hear the cries of proud, put-together people who pray like the Pharisee. Thank you, God, that I'm not like. Oh, and by the way, could you give me? He hears the cries of needy people like David, humbled people poor, imperfect people. What David realized was that though he was poor, scared to death, and trouble surrounding him on every side, his God was rich in mercy, greater than his fears, and infinitely stronger than any enemy he would ever face. God delivers humbled, imperfect people who cry out to him, not because of our goodness, not because of David's, but because of his goodness. And so David enjoys the deliverance of God. Verses 5 and 7. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. This is what David has experienced. This is what he has enjoyed it says the faces of those who look to him are radiant. Why? Because their anxious, worrisome hearts have been replaced with a humble confidence in a gracious God. Have you ever met someone worried, anxious? You can see it all over their face. Our faces are windows into our hearts. When we're filled with worry, we're filled with anxiety, not looking to the Lord it's written all over us. But those who look to the Lord, those who no longer fear man, but fear the Lord, their faces are radiant. Moses got a glimpse of the glory of God, and he had to wear a veil because his face was radiant with confidence in a gracious God. The one who fears the Lord is filled with joy and will never be put to shame in verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. There are several interpretations as to what the angel of the Lord means, and we don't have time to unpack the differing views on this phrase, but the point here is that the Lord watches over and delivers his people, which is a massive theme in this psalm. It's a massive theme in all of Scripture, but just get the image. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. It's a military-like term. He sets up camp. You get the image that God's people are delivered from things we have no idea is happening. He is so good. He delivers us in ways that are visible and invisible, ways that we see and ways we have no idea what's happening. But he is good, and he encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. It's also important to see in this psalm that we're not promised that we will not have fears. We're not promised that we will not have troubles. In fact, David says later in this psalm, many are the afflictions of the righteous, 
That's a reality that the righteous will experience afflictions and troubles and fears. It's life. But David does promise that the Lord is faithful, that he delivers, that he sustains, that he preserves and gives grace in the midst and delivers out of. And so now David is going to turn around and offer another invitation. This psalm is very much like a church service. He worships, he shares his testimony, and then he invites others to come in again. We see in this psalm that David oozes joy and he is not at rest until others join him in this experience. So we see a plea to enjoy, verses 8 through 10. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you as saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. The first thing I want us to see is that mere affirmation of the Lord is insufficient. It is not enough to merely affirm the existence of God, the goodness of God, the grace of God, the love of God, and on and on and on. It's not enough to merely affirm those truths. David is saying, I have experienced the goodness of God, and I want you in on this. I hesitate to use the the word experience. It can be misconstrued, but that's what he means. Taste and see for yourself. My fear in this room, my fear in the church culture of the South is that many have tasted and seen that the gifts of the Lord are good while not tasting and seeing that the Lord himself is good. Don't miss this. The gifts of the Lord are good, but we must remember the great giver. You can see this especially in this season when people talk about what they're thankful for. And again, these things are good. Don't get me wrong. They are very good, and we ought to thank the Lord for what he has given. Do you hear people? What are you thankful for? I'm thankful for my health and my happiness and my whole families around the table Thanksgiving, what if next Thanksgiving you don't have your health? What if next Thanksgiving you're fighting day by day for happiness? What if next Thanksgiving that chair is no longer occupied that has been occupied ever since you can remember because the Lord has taken them? What if the Lord wipes out your list of things I'm thankful for? It's what he's done to David. David is scared for his life, flees to a cave, tastes and see that the Lord is good. That blows my mind. God has brought David to a place where he is all David needs. What if God wipes out our list of things we're thankful for? Is he still good? Is he still worthy? Can we still cry out with David, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good? What if God is the only thing on our list of things that we're thankful for? He is still good, friend. What does this phrase even mean, to taste and see? It's kind of awkward. It's strange. We don't use these phrases. I think it means total reliance. True faith. There's a difference between false faith and true faith. False faith just affirms. False faith can say, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again three days later for my sins. But mere affirmation without the affection is false. True faith, Pastor Ray Ortland says, is to do a belly flop on God with all our sin and all our failure and all our fears. That's the image here. Do a belly flop. Taste and see. He will not disappoint. And this is totally contradictory to how the world teaches us to live and how we, by our very nature, want to live. However, total reliance upon the Lord leads to true satisfaction. Verses 9 and 10. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him have no lack. No lack. You can trust him and he will provide. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided. 
But verse 10, he throws this illustration, and the young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. The young lions suffer want and hunger. This is how the world teaches us to live. This is how we, by our very nature, want to live. As, as I was reflecting on this illustration, I was thinking, if I were going to be an animal, I would want to be top of the food chain. I mean, a lion. But I was reading a commentator, and he was reflecting and writing on the life of a lion. Their life is spent always craving, always hunting, always fighting, never really satisfied. And often they die alone and painful deaths because of their life spent for their cravings. This is how we are taught to live. Look out for me, my needs, my wants. If we live like this, we will always suffer want and hunger. But those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Total reliance upon the Lord is the only way to be truly satisfied. So we can either taste and see the limitations of a me-centered life, or we can trust an all-powerful God and taste and see that He is good. So what? Just two questions. The first question is, have I tasted and seen that the Lord is good? You could ask it this way, am I tasting and seeing that the Lord is good? Look at verse 8. Don't miss this glorious truth. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Now, these are the same people. The person who tastes and sees that the Lord is good is the person who takes refuge in him. You don't take, taste and see that the Lord is good and walk away from that. You take refuge in him. And then it says that this person is blessed. Now, why are they blessed? David gives us a little clue here. The end of this psalm, in verse 22, he says that none of those, zero of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Condemnation, deliverance, salvation. You've got two polar opposites. Condemnation, total opposite of salvation. To be condemned by God, to be eternally punished and separated from him in a real place called hell, but none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. And the good news is we, in this day, in this age, sitting in this room, we get to read a passage like this in the Old Testament, Psalm 34, through the lens of the gospel, through the lens of God's redemptive work for us in Christ Jesus. We have a glorious truth that Paul records for us in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation for those who take refuge in Christ. There's no condemnation for those who trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross. There's no condemnation for those who bank every ounce of hope that they have in the Lord Jesus. There's no condemnation for those who taste and see that the gospel of Jesus Christ is good. Amen. That Jesus lived the life that we could not live, died the death that we deserve to die, three days later rose again, conquering all our fears, all our troubles, our greatest enemy, sin and death. He is the reigning king. He alone is worthy to be praised. Have you tasted and seen that Jesus is good? Or does this verse seem totally irrelevant to you? Are you tasting and seeing that the world is good? You want nothing to do with Jesus? You are like the young lion who will suffer want and hunger, always craving and always living off of those cravings and pursuing a me-centered life because you love your sin. You will always be left wanting and hungry Never be satisfied. Jesus alone is good. Or are you another group of people who affirm Jesus? Maybe come here every week. 
but you haven't tasted and seen that he's good. This verse seems totally irrelevant. Taste and see? This is an idea, quote by John Piper. It completely changed my life. I was reading his book, Desiring God, as I was preparing for this message, and I saw this quote. I underlined it, put a star beside it, and I wrote a note when I read it many years ago about how that idea changed my life. I was the disinterested worshiper for a very long time, and he wrote this, and it opened my eyes to the glory and goodness of God. He said, the goodness of God in Christ Jesus, the very foundation of worship, is not a thing you pay your respects to out of some kind of disinterested reverence. No, it is something to be enjoyed. That is good news. God is not glorified by disinterested reverence, but by delight from the depths of our souls in the goodness of the cross of Christ. That is true worship. That is what we're called to. Jesus said in John 6, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. What Jesus is saying is taste and see that I am good, that eternal life comes nowhere else through the blood of Jesus. Taste and see that Jesus is good. Have you? And the second question is this. If you have tasted and seen that Jesus is good, am I giving my life so that others may join me in tasting and seeing that the Lord is good? We cannot miss David's desire in this psalm that others would join him in the praise of the Lord God. He can't help it. He has to invite others in. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And here's the, here's the basic principle that David is showing us. When you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, you inevitably desire that others taste and see the same goodness No one walks up to the Grand Canyon and just keeps it to themselves. If you're the first one there and your family's getting out of the car, you're going to come and see. Next week, we're going to look at the Great Commission. And I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Jesus commands his disciples to go and make disciples. Pastor Jeff talked about the missionary God. And his mission is to make himself known. And the way he does this is by making disciples who make disciples. And here's what this means. We as tasters and seers of the goodness of God seek to make tasters and seers of the goodness of God. That's what we give our life to. So we obey the command of Jesus, number one, because he said so, but because we can't help it. Oh, what joy there is in giving our lives so that others might join us in tasting and seeing the goodness of God in Christ Jesus. There is nothing greater. So as we see in just a minute, let us apply Psalm 34. Let us magnify the Lord. Let us exalt his name together. But may we not stop in this room. Jesus has other sheep that are not of this fold. They will listen to his voice. They will taste and see his goodness. So as we leave, may we go with the same news we enjoy. Let's pray. Father, you are good, and your steadfast love endures forever. I pray that we taste and see the goodness of this truth this morning. That we right now would magnify the Lord and exalt your name together. May you be exalted in this place. May you be exalted in the hearts and lives of every person in this room. And may you be exalted in this city and through the nations, through the work that you have done through this local church. You've called us to great things, but you have called us to joy. So may we worship you right now in spirit and in truth and in joy. 
You are good. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.